IAF members, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Robert Kaplan, President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, who will be our featured speaker for this timely IAF roundtable discussion on the impacts of COVID-19 on the U.S. oil and gas sector. Uh, Governor Kaplan will provide his macroeconomic forecast and highlight relevant impacts on the energy sector in the Dallas Fed's district that includes Texas, New Mexico, and Louisiana. I think he might also have some views on global energy markets. We'll take some questions immediately following Governor Kaplan's presentation, uh, but let me say a few words uh, to begin. Uh, Texas is still recovering from the severe winter storm, and we hope everyone at the Dallas Fed and all of our friends in Texas are doing well. The storm not only resulted in the loss of electricity and heat for millions of people, but also shut down refineries and oil and gas production, the largest producing basin in the United States. While the oil and gas sector begins the early stages of recovery following the pandemic, the storm is a reminder of the need to also focus on energy infrastructure vulnerabilities and extreme weather events caused by climate change. After Governor Kaplan's presentation and Q&A, we'll dive into the subject in more depth with the presentation by Kunal Patel, the business economist in the research department at the Dallas Fed. Kunal will uh, review the evolving recovery in the U.S. oil and gas sector, drawing from the latest findings of the Dallas Fed energy survey to help assess U.S. supply and export potential. The energy survey is a fantastic product that improves the transparency and open dialogue within the industry and key stakeholders. I'm also very pleased that we have Dr. Leila Benali, the former chief economist and head of strategy of the Arab Petroleum Investment Corp 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 Corporation, Epicorp, uh, to join the discussion. Uh, Leila will highlight how other producers' strategies are playing out versus U.S. shale and how they absorb COVID-19 uh, shocks to market stability. Before we get started with our speakers, let me just make a few brief comments. Uh, of course, uh, financial and energy market dynamics remain closely related. Without the robust above ground financial market conditions and accommodating monetary policies that govern risk appetite and access to capital in the US, the shale revolution would not have turned into such a game changer for global energy markets. Energy security and market stability is a core mission of the IEF and we are constantly re-examining and monitoring conditions to alert member countries and policymakers to avoid potential headwinds. Many producers and con uh, many producer uh, economies have been under pressure since we entered the lower for longer era in 2014 that was created by the breakthrough of sh the short cycle shale on global markets. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the policy, policy shifts it inspires may now turn the table on consumer economies as deferred investment revives upward pressure on prices. The IAF, in collaboration with Boston, the Boston Consulting Group published a report last year on oil and gas investment in the new risk environment that warned of a future supply shock caused by oil and gas companies reducing investments due, the, due to the pandemic. Already in recent days, several banks are already revising their price forecasts higher. Excessive price volatility harms both consumer and producer economies. Dialogue, cooperation, policy cohesion are critical to address these important issues. Without it, risks to global energy security will rise, social disparities and emissions will increase, and the industry's ability to invest in infrastructure and deploy new technologies will weaken. The return of non-OPEC supply to meet resurgent demand is a key concern and potential headwind for the global economy. So it's why I'm pleased that Governor Kaplan is joining us today to give his perspective on the macroeconomic outlook and the effect on the US oil and gas sector, one of the largest non-OPEC supply sources. Governor Kaplan, the floor is yours.
about the uh, U.S. economy, global economy, and then I'll talk a little bit about energy. And I'll do this briefly just to set the table, and I'll kick it back to Joe, and we'll we'll take uh, questions. Um, so we all know that the U.S. and global economy suffered a severe contraction in 2020. Uh, for the U.S., the bulk of the contraction occurred in the second quarter, where we had an annualized uh, decline in GDP of over 30 uh, percent. But in the United States, uh, as well as most countries in the rest of the world, the timing varied a little bit, but the pattern was similar in that a severe contraction and then uh, most of the global economy began to rebound. In the United States, uh, we started uh, growing again, we think at the Dallas Fed, probably sometime late April, early May. Uh, and so we had a third quarter uh, expansion in the United States of over 30% annualized. And we ended the year last year with about a 2.5% contraction. Uh, that was better performance than it might have been. And it was better probably than some other countries in the world because of substantial amount of fiscal policy as well as accommodative monetary policy that helped mitigate the shocks. And in particular, uh, what, what, what fiscal policy, one of the things fiscal policy accomplished was to ensure that household incomes in 2020 did not decline. Normally when you have a downturn, household incomes decline and consumer spending declines, declines. We didn't see that in the United States, mainly due to fiscal policy. Uh, you had household income stay solid, consumer spending stayed strong. And yes, it's true, people didn't spend on hotels and restaurants and arts and entertainment and other, other venues. But it's not that they didn't spend, they just shifted the spending to other things like home improvements, a uh, number of other, uh, number of other uh, uh, things that they could do at home. And so a number of companies uh, in the United States had actually very good years, particularly if they were able to interact with their customers using technology and work remotely. Uh, the, the, the other thing that we saw though, is uh, the, the pandemic we know around the world disproportionately affected person-to-person -person contact businesses. Uh, again, uh, restaurants, travel, uh, uh, automobile driving was down meaningfully, uh, arts, entertainment. Uh, and it also disproportionately in the United States affected workers who had uh, lower educational attainment and were lower income. And so if you have a college education, for example, in the United States, it is, it is far more likely you were able to make it through the pandemic working remotely and not, and, and you, it, there's a much better chance you didn't lose your job and you didn't lose income. If on the other hand, you had a high school education or less and were lower income, it's far less likely that you were able to work remotely, you were more likely to be in a job where it depended on being there in person. Uh, and uh, as a result, you lost income and uh, fiscal policy was critical for you to be able to make ends meet. Um, and that's still the case today. So as we head into 2021, uh, I would still say how well we manage this virus, not just in the United States, but globally, still is the number one determinant of what kind of year we're going to have. Uh, uh, and I'll come back to other policies, but uh, we think it's critical uh, that we continue to vaccinate populations around the world. And as we increasingly vaccinate populations around the world, it is more likely that mobility and engagement will improve. Uh, in the United States, for example, we think mobility and engagement will gradually improve between now and June. And we think we'll see substantial improvements in mobility and engagement in the third quarter and the fourth quarter. So because of that at the Dallas Fed, 
our GDP estimate uh, for the United States for 2021 shows growth at 5%. Uh, and, and I would say if we're wrong, the risks are to the upside that we may grow faster. We think uh, uh, some of that growth will be back end loaded toward the end of the year as mobility and engagement improves. Uh, we think the unemployment rate will continue to uh, meaningfully decline and we'll see some firming and in inflation. Okay, so what's, and I'll, I'm doing this very, very quickly deliberately because I wanna talk about implications for energy. So what's all this mean for energy? Uh, I don't need to tell you, uh, and I can speak to the United States, 2020 was a year of a supply shock and a demand shock, excess inventory uh, as a residual throughout the entire year. We still got it today. And we've seen uh, restructurings, uh, failures, consolidations in the entire oil sector. And so the oil sector today looks different than it did a year ago. It's more consolidated, it's more disciplined, uh, there's been an effort where possible to deleverage and, and, and capital has not flowed in to the industry. It's flowed into energy broadly in terms of alternatives, but capital, the, the industry is capital starved. Um, and as a result of that, most producers have told their shareholders that the extent we have higher prices, they're going to return a meaningfully higher percentage of that cash flow to shareholders instead of in new drilling, as uh, unlike what they've done in the past. And so because of that, we think US production will basically stay flat uh, in 2021, meaning we, on, we ended the year producing about 11 million barrels a day. Again, it went through a lot of ups and downs and shut-ins, but we ended the year around 11 million barrels a day uh, we, we think this year production will be basically flat. Uh, and, and that assumes, yes, prices continue to firm. Um, because at, at, with the forecast I just described, and with global growth improving and mobility engagement improving and driving improving and flying improving, demand is going to increase as we go through 2021. And so we'll have to see how all this unfolds. Uh, but there's no question that uh, we're going we're gonna to continue to work off the excess inventory from the shock in the first part of 2020. Uh, we still think it may well be till the, not until the end of 21 or early 22 before that excess inventory gets worked off. Kunal Patel is going to take you through that in more detail. Uh, but this is a more disciplined industry. It's going to be an industry that, that is more inclined to return capital on the margin rather than drill. And that'll change the dynamics. So we've said regularly, and I've said over the last many months, we will aggressively over the next number of years transition to wind, solar, battery storage, use techniques like sequestration and many other initiatives to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and transition energy production to alternatives. Having said that, the world, based on our estimates, is going to be heavily reliant on fossil fuels, not for years, but for decades to come. And so how we do the transition is going to be very challenging and very tricky because we still need a hot, healthy fossil fuel industry. I guess, Joe, I can make a comment on, on Texas last week, and then I'm going to turn it back to you. So uh, I'll just give the, 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 the key points. Uh, there were a number of things that happened uh, last week in the state of Texas. We had a historic drop in temperatures. Uh, the grid, the power grid broadly, and I'm talking about uh, powered wind, solar, uh, oil and gas related, natural gas. There was a challenge across the entire grid because of lack of weatherization. Uh, and, and I don't need to tell you because you've been reading in the news what the impacts of that have been, uh, power lost, business interruption, and so on. There was a, there was a second uh, result, though, away from the power grid, and that is even apart from problems with the power grid, many pipes and other uh, infrastructure in the state 
also was not weatherized. So even without the power grid issues, we think we think at the Dallas Fed, our contacts tell us there would have been a pipe problem and a water problem because many pipes in homes, businesses across the board are not also not insulated and not weatherized. And you had freeze. And then when when the temperatures started to to increase, you had pipes bursting and loss of water ability. The the um, the power interruption is not quite rectified, but basically at this point rectified. The loss of uh, oil and gas production and refinery outages uh, will get, if not rectified now, they'll be rectified over the next number of days. The water issues and the pipes issues that's gonna be a little bit more lingering. It'll still hopefully get resolved in the next number of weeks, but this is a matter of businesses and homes waiting for plumbers, literally, to come to their house and fix pipes. And this is an arduous, slow process. And that may go on for a bit more, that'll go on for a little bit longer. And again, I think some of that has to do with the grid, but a lot of it, based on our analysis, has to do with just the, the historic low in temperature and, and, um, and lack of weatherization for that kind of infrastructure in the state. And so let me stop there and turn it back to Joe. Well, thanks for that. Uh, I have, uh, to anyone watching, I apologize. I was having a little bit of audio issues, but it's been resolved. So, uh, so no, no issues uh, now. Um, and it's, it's good to hear the update on, on the storm. And I'm confident if anyone can figure this out quickly and, and fix fix the problems, it's, it's our friends in, in Texas. Um, but I wanna move to uh, uh, an initial opening question and just remind everybody, if you have a question, please use the Q and A uh, function on the Zoom platform and we'll do our best to, to get the questions in. Um, I wanted to zero in on something that you touched on and, and, just, and just get a little bit more uh, uh, additional perspective from you last week. We, we held our annual IEA, IEF, OPEC Energy Outlook Symposium, and uh, we heard from Occidental Petroleum CEO Vicky Hullab, who uh, touched on what you said about the investor community, that they're changing their focus for producers by now seeking value over growth. Um, in addition, Vicky said that the impacts of the pandemic combined with this new investor imperative likely means that the U.S. won't get back to 13 million barrels a day, uh, that high watermark anytime soon. So I'm just wondering on your views on these issues, if you could just expand a little bit more in terms of the investor focus and also the return to shale record growth of 2019. Okay, so, um, and, and, and Vicki Holub and Occidental Petroleum is a good example. And I'm sure she, she took you through in your session. They are spending substantial amounts of money on sequestration, and, and I, I mean substantial. Uh, and they're doing that because they're trying to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions footprint. I think that's indicative of a range of activities you're gonna see across the whole sector where they're gonna put more capital in to limiting their greenhouse gas emissions. While this is going on, uh, uh, they can also tell you they're not able to attract capital. It's very challenging to attract capital into the sector. Uh, and yes, shareholders are being much more insistent that to the extent we get firming in oil prices, a higher percentage of that cash flow. It's not like some of that cash flow won't go in to new drilling, but, uh, but it'll be a smaller percentage than it was before. And the other thing is I mentioned in cash flow in the past, the industry would have, would have borrowed money and, and attracted capital to fund new drilling. They're going to have to, it may change what I'm about to say, but for now, they're having to depend almost exclusively on cash flow to fund drilling, not sources of new capital. And, and as we just said, they're going to have to be more disciplined with their cash flow. So What's the impact going to be? I think one of the, 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 it's unpredictable and why it's unpredictable, whether we'll get back to 12.8, 12.9, 13 million barrels a day. Uh, you're going to have a big jump in demand. 
we, we, there's an issue about what will OPEC do, OPEC plus Russia, you know, what will happen with other sources of supply around the world. Um, but I think uh, it's fair to say uh, right now, this is the mindset. I've learned I'm a business person and my career is at a business person. I learned as a business person, sometimes if prices get high enough, mindsets can change. Uh, and, and, but, but for now to get back to 13 million barrels a day, yes, you would need a change in mindset, probably spurred by meaningfully higher prices. Can I predict whether that will or won't happen? No, I can't predict it, but I think we should be on watch for it. Uh, because business people, when there's a chance to make a larger margin, sometimes they adapt and sometimes capital flows adapt, but, uh, but because of the move toward uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions, the capital flows part is probably very uh, questionable. Well, the, the Oxy's carbon management uh, 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 moves, I think, might actually uh, attract some, some investors, but that's probably a unique situation uh, to them. Um, one of the things she also said was that the break-even uh, cost in, for shale is about forty dollars, based on historical price uh, 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 numbers. And, and so I'm just moving to one of the questions that just touched on your last comment uh, regarding the Goldman Sachs uh, uh, forecast that just came out, I think yesterday or today, uh, that has Brent at seventy-five later this year and whether that price would allow U.S. shale to resume full-scale growth? I think a lot of it is gonna depend on whether uh, participants in the market, and that's drillers, but importantly, capital providers, think that price is sustainable. If they think it's a bump, that actually, you know, in future years, GDP growth gets back to trend, uh, I, I, think, I think that's gonna be a lot of the debate. Um, do you think we'll see some more, more consolidation in the sector, especially in, in your district? I would, th I would think so. Uh, and, and the reason for that is scale is going to become more and more important. So, uh, and investing in, in greenhouse gas emissions and water and sand treatment, it's going to be more expensive to produce. Scale will matter more to make those investments. Okay, another question here. Uh, the U.S. Uh, has a new president and his party now has the majorities in, in Congress. Uh, we're seeing many groups encourage the new administration and Congress to reinstate the crude export ban that was lifted during the Obama administration and led to this record production in the U.S. that we've been talking about. Uh, in your view, would the impacts, uh, what would the impacts be to the U.S. economy and the energy sector if the U.S. reestablished a ban on crude exports? Uh, so I'll, I'll be a little bit careful because it's, uh, I guess this won't surprise you, that, that is a little bit of a political uh, discussion, a little bit politically sensitive, but, but I, I would put it this way, our, our contacts tell us that, uh, that allowing exports just made it much more, uh, gave them much more ability to manage the flows, manage their inventories, uh, and gave them more operating flexibility. And my guess is they're gonna tell me that that's still the case uh, with, with the current situation. I think so if you had an export ban, I think they would tell you it would, it, they're dealing with a lot of challenges. This would add another that would uh, on the margin reduce their operating flexibility. Uh, another question uh, about the uh, new administration, how, how will the energy and climate policies affect energy investment and U.S. oil and gas export uh, potential, sort of the same, same question. Yeah, so it, 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 we've already said we're in a situation now, now where uh, there's been very little flow of capital into oil and gas related investments, fossil fuels. Um, and, and I think there's plenty of capital flowing into wind, solar, alternatives, battery storage, new technologies. Uh, I think all things being equal, uh, the moves that we're making globally will, uh, will intensify that. Uh, I guess the thing that 
could could change like as we just said flows if prices got high enough and depending on what what the supply demand outlook is and what the gdp outlook is around the world it's possible that will create more flows than we have now into oil and gas under if people get more optimistic that while it's going to be declining as a percentage of total product uh, total, total energy output and consumption it's still going to be a viable investment maybe that would change capital flows but for the moment all this means it's going to be tougher they're going to it's extent oil and gas is going to do things it's going to have to be out of cash flow got it well listen we'll we'll end the first uh, q a session there governor kaplan thanks for uh, joining us today and uh if thanks you can you. stick around uh, stick around but otherwise we know you have to go because you have a busy day um so let's now turn our, uh, to our panel discussion. And uh, a reminder, again, just to use that uh, Q&A function on the Zoom platform to pose a question as if one, one occurs to you during the, this, this next uh, discussion. Uh, first, a little background for those of you who may not be familiar. Uh, the US Federal Reserve System is divided into 12 districts across the US. The Dallas Federal Reserve is in the 11th district, which includes Texas, Southern New Mexico, and Northern Louisiana. But more relevant for today's discussions, it's also home to the Permian Basin, Eagle, Short, Eagle Ford Shale, Haynesville Shale, Barnett Shale, and approximately uh, 6 million barrels per day of refining capacity. So this puts the Dallas Fed, I think, in the best position to evaluate the US oil and gas industry and produce insightful research and analysis. And one such example is the Dallas Fed's quarterly energy survey of US oil and gas firms, which in many ways gauges the outlook uh, of the industry. So now I'll turn the floor over to Kunal uh, Patel of the Dallas Fed to, to make his presentation. Kunal, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joe. Um, let me share my screen. And uh, let's see, I know that we have people joining us from all around the world. So good evening, good morning, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Let me go ahead and make this full screen. Um, again, thank you for joining us. I'll be discussing supply resilience and uh, export potential for the US oil and gas sector. And uh, this slide goes through the key points I'll be discussing today. First, upstream activity in the US uh, uh, sector. Activity in the U.S. upstream sector has increased modestly in fourth quarter 2020, but that's from a low base. Uh, second key point is that U.S. production this year is likely to either remain flat or grow at a slightly slower pace than before. And this is given firms focus on capital disciplines this is something that uh, President Kaplan just touched on a moment ago. Um, this is because shareholders are looking to reward uh, firms for value over growth. So publicly listed firms will be reluctant to spend more. Third, US crude exports have recently plateaued given lower production. And I'll go a little bit further into that in future slides. And lastly, the recent drop in US crude production due to colder than usual weather is likely to be transitory with production rebounding to prior levels in the coming weeks. So at the Dallas Fed, we run the quarterly Dallas Fed energy survey. Uh, we've been running the survey for over five years and have over 200 US upstream firms registered. Uh, this slide provides results from our December fourth quarter release. Uh, every quarter we ask upstream firms how their business activity, capital expenditures, employment, and more compares to the previous quarter. Uh, the responses are aggregated into a diffusion index, a positive index signals expansion, uh, and a negative index signals contraction. Uh, latest results, you know, it, it suggests a modest increase in business activity, but that is from low base after multiple quarters of declines. Uh, capital expenditures edged up, but employment continued to decline, but at a slightly slower pace. Uh, on a positive note, executives noted that their company outlook improved and that their uncertainty declined. Um, and as of the fourth quarter, executives expect WTI prices to end 2021 at $50 per barrel, and we are currently above those levels. So you may be wondering what is driving this, again, modest increase in activity. Uh, the energy survey allows us to ask timely questions through our special questions. Uh, one of these from the third quarter 2020 release is at what price one would expect a substantial increase 
and the completion of drilled but uncompleted wells or ducts, and at what price one would expect a substantial increase in U.S. oil rigs. On the left, the red bars show the completion of ducts, and the blue bars are new rigs. Uh, the results suggest 46 to $50 per barrel for a substantial increase in the completion of ducts, and 51 to 55 for a substantial increase in the oil rig count. Although the deviation was larger for rigs, with 18% noted that above $60 was needed. Uh, the right side provides the number of wells drilled, completed, along with the duct count from data provider Keros, uh, which uses satellite imagery to track oil flow activity on a well-by-well -well basis. Uh, you will notice that completions overtook uh, drilling in August and that ducts have been declining since then. Uh, as the number of ducts have declined, we've seen operators add rigs, uh, primarily to bridge the gap between the number of wells drilled and the number of wells completed. Uh, prices have surpassed the $51 to $55 per barrel, which survey participants said was needed to see a substantial increase in the oil rig count. And we've seen the oil rig count increase 77% from the August 2020 bottom and 14% since the start of 2021. Additionally, what may be driving this recent, again, modest increase in activity is that with the recent increase in oil prices, firms can profitably drill uh, at, at current prices. And you know, every first quarter of the year, we ask a special question regarding what price firms need to profitably drill a new well, providing a break-even price for wells in the shale patch. Uh, for the first quarter of 2020, the average across the sample was $49 per barrel. Additionally, across regions, the average break-even price ranges from $46 to $52 per barrel. Uh, we'll again ask this specific question in first quarter 2021, but as long as the break-even has remained at similar levels, that suggests that firms can properly drill at current prices. However, while firms can profitably drill at current prices, that doesn't necessarily mean you will see a significant increase in activity going forward. On the left-hand side, the results from the Barclays EMP spending outlook run in late 2020 suggest capital spending will be down 6% year over year for North America. These numbers will be updated after final budgets are released this month and next, but expect spending to be roughly flat. The right-hand side provides the aggregate free cash flow for our US independent operators. Uh, as investors are looking to reward value over production growth, public firms are likely to keep spending flat despite higher oil prices, as that will allow them to generate more free cash flow to return capital to shareholders. Additionally, you know, given that the sector was only free cash flow neutral in 2020, uh, they'll be increasingly focused on being free cash flow positive this year to primarily win back investors. Moving on to slide seven, so from looking through the outlooks of the agencies and OPEC, uh, they are all currently forecasting US production will increase in 2021, uh, although their views vary on the amount of the increase. And in the table on, this, on the second uh, column, you'll see the December 20 to December 21 change or increase in production. Um, at the Dallas Fed, we model production by major basin using well-level data to create our US production forecast. Uh, for the US, our team base case forecast calls for production to see no change from December 2020 to December 2021. This assumes that well completions are flat year over year. And if I was to back out using our model how completions would change year over year for the agencies, the Energy Information Administration and the International Energy Agency forecast assumes a slight increase. I currently only have the latest quarterly forecast for OPEC and not the monthly data, but the quarterly data suggests US production will grow in excess of 1 million barrels per day from December 2020 to December 2021, with most of the growth in the fourth quarter. Uh, it's important to know that US production has generally surprised to the upside in past years. Uh, reasons include spending from private operators. There's thousands of them, and they aren't bound by capital discipline and public operators outspending their annual budget. Uh, and these are two items to monitor this year. And it's a reason why US shale has been so resilient. 
you know, transitioning a bit on slide eight, you know, regarding export potential, we've seen U.S. crude oil exports plateau after increases starting in 2017 when the export ban was lifted. Uh, previously, exports were constrained by infrastructure, both in terms of takeaway capacity from the Permian and loading capacity at export terminals. However, there is now ample takeaway capacity for the, from the Permian, and the recent plateau is driven by lower crude production. While it is unknown what path crude oil exports will take in 2021, it is likely to track the path of U.S. crude oil production. And for my last slide, I wanted to leave with an interesting hypothesis. Uh, the biggest challenge for operators is predicting the price of oil. And price is very important. It drives profitability. As previously mentioned, in every first quarter since 2016, we have asked our EMP survey participants what oil price is required to profitably drill a new well for their firm. Our latest data point for first quarter 2020 again is $49 per barrel. And an observation we have noticed is that the back end of the WTI futures curve shown as the red line has followed the break evens closely. And one potential hypothesis is that the market relies on shale as a high cost producer on the margin to provide additional supply to meet global demand growth and as hence set the back end of the futures curve close to this price with the front end mirroring supply and demand. Uh, I recommend reading our May 2019 post, Break Even Oil Prices Underscore Shale's Impact on the Market. Post provides additional insights. You know, it's well read. I would say over roughly 25,000 people have read this post. It's more to get you to, to, to check it out. And it's been cited widely by media groups. So please do check out our post to see additional insights on this specific topic. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your time. You know, my, my contact information is on the slide. It's also available on the Dallas Fed website. Please feel free to reach out to me with any questions or if you'd like to have a discussion. Our next energy survey will be released on March 24th. Uh, it'll be, it's available on our Dallas Fed website. Um, and uh, I'll now hand it off to uh, Dr. Banali. I think we'll take questions after her presentation. Thank you very much, Kunal. Thank you, Dr. Manelli. Let me uh, go ahead and stop my screen share so you can add yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Joe, do you want me to start making some comments about the rest of the world? Thank you. Please do. Uh, thank you very much. I'll, uh, I'll just try to mirror actually the very interesting points raised by uh, President Kaplan and uh, uh, by Kunal in, in their interesting insights and try to uh, cover the rest of the world, but primarily some of the main, main producers and their strategies vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, US Shell. So I think uh, let, me, let me start first by saying a few words about some of the lessons that we learned from, from the current crisis. And I think there are, of course, many, many lessons that we can draw from the current multifaceted crisis. But I would like here to uh, focus on three key lessons that would be relevant today for our discussion on oil and gas and investments. I think lesson number one, we discovered a world that is much more interdependent, but we also discovered an industry uh, an oil and gas industry that is much more interdependent with the 2020 crisis. We discovered the restrictions to projects and supply chains uh, and the LNG and shipping business highly depends on Asian shipyards, oil and gas field services, wherever you are, are equally dependent on specialized engineering in, in Lombardy, Italy. Uh, China with its huge manufacturing capacity is equivalent to uh, that of the 13 emerging markets will not be easy to replace. So all these were heavily, as you know, affected by the first waves of 2019, of, uh, sorry, of COVID-19. Uh, there is, of course, increasing pressure in specific parts of the oil and gas value chain to decentralize and to localize. And I will draw here on the example of Saudi Arabia that has been quite active uh, with its in kingdom total value lo localization program that is now accelerating its oil and gas industry localization program. So that's lesson number one. Lesson number two, uh, climate, of course. There's, I think, now a clear awareness that the most extreme energy demand response you can get by locking down half of the world population during weeks, by homeschooling a billion of students, uh, by reducing the consumption of transportation and industrial fuels is not enough to reach the Paris Agreement. 
Um, so if you add to it the extreme weather events that Joe uh, referred to uh, that we had this year, I think the E definitely becomes the most important letter in ESG now for all oil and gas producers and their shareholders. So I think more than five years after Paris, climate is now considered a systemic risk for the financial system. And uh, when I talk about systemic risk, in, which is in central bank language, uh, refers to the global financial crisis of 2008. Um, that's for lesson number two. Lesson number three is my last lesson for today. Um, I think whether we believe in a massive behavioral change in terms of energy demand, whether we, or not, whether we believe in, in peak demand or not, I think the main impact of this crisis is that energy demand will start being modeled differently. Uh, Kunal's job, my job will start to be different uh, because we will have, and we have long-term unemployment in affected sectors around the world, in, in, in emerging markets, as well as, uh, as well as OECD countries. We have a large number of bankruptcies that we still need to figure out in the second round and third round effects of these bankruptcies. We have deep restructuring in several sectors not only in the, in, in the energy space, all at the same time. And to add to the complexity, I think the recovery will not be synchronized because between those countries like the US mobilizing maybe the largest stimulus plan since the Great Depression to those that are on the verge of, become, the verge of becoming failed states. So I think from a simple oil production policy perspective, I think the arithmetics of, uh, of the so-called call on OPEC crude will have to be redefined. Um, so I, I'm conscious of the time. I will not bore you with unprecedented numbers. I'm sure you have heard them uh, many times in, in, in similar meetings in terms of oil and gas demand fall, in terms of the fast recovery uh, and, and the dramatic volatility that we witnessed in prices. Uh, I would focus instead, I think, on the implications for investments with two key emerging conclusions. Um, if you look at most producers around the world, uh, those who will be able to invest in the right assets in the short to medium term are really positioning themselves to gain market share in the longer term. And conclusion number two is that those will have to position themselves in, and I will not call it a shrink in market share, but a plateau in market share. Because I, I believe as, as Dan Jurgen puts it nicely in, in, in the new map, uh, it will likely take two or three years for the global economy to work its way back to $19 trillion. Uh, the, the, the $100 trillion economy could be as much as a decade away. So when it comes to investments, I just like you to remember a few, I mean, a few numbers, but a few, so, uh, an important range, uh, 25 to 35%. That's the range that I would like to keep in mind. The IEF BCG report indicated that Indeed, oil and gas companies cut their capex by 34% in 2020. That's slightly more than the reduction, 28% reduction that we've seen following 2014. And I like to uh, think that this is more than the 20, 25% witnessed in the wider energy sector. But it's also important to remember that post-2014, investments were cut roughly 25% annually for two years in a row, for two consecutive years. So how long do you think the current downturn in oil and gas investments will last this time? I think this year, and, and, and Kunal uh, referred to that uh, earlier, uh, the, the, the industry has pledged worldwide to invest around $300 billion in upstream oil and gas, uh, less than a third of that in North America, as, as, as Kunal showed us. This is flat compared to 2020, but it's still the lowest in 15 years. Um, I think it might be different this time uh, in terms of when the investments will pick up again, because we, this is a dramatically entrenched industry worldwide. It, has, it was hit by three crises in one decade. And, and I think for the most part is undervalued. Of course, I think pre-crisis growth expectations were already modest. Investors were being viewed as abandoning the sectors as it provided really the lowest returns to shareholders during the last decade and by a wide margin. And this was way before uh, the ESG uh, issues and, and, and concerns. Uh, but the industry has witnessed the end, in the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021, a flow of new investments by retail index 
and institutional investors. So my hypothesis, even for the rest of the world, is that you have uh, the ingredients for more consolidations, mergers and acquisitions, market share repositioning, particularly around those low cost, low carbon assets are, are, are definitely there. And uh, not only US Shell, but really in the wider oil and gas sector. And, and Vicky Holub, it's true, uh, shared with us last week her $40 per barrel break even price for any project today. That coincides with the survey results. I mean, nine dollars less, nine dollars less than the survey results that Kunal has mentioned. I think it's more or less the same ceiling used in the strategies of the large national oil companies, which have access to low-cost, low-carbon assets. Um, if I want to push the argument a bit further, I would like to frame it, and, and, and I'll finish there with, in terms of the characteristics or the features of the winners which will emerge post COVID-19 global reset. Well, first, uh, characteristic number one, those who have access to low cost, low carbon assets on an oil and gas basis. We are at a, at a transformational point where cost curves will start to mean something, oil and gas transform into a normal commodity and you have low cost producers dominating in market share and the highest cost producers in the tail end. In MENA, in the Middle East and North Africa region, you have a concentration of low-cost, low-carbon producers. And I'm referring to a study published in 2018, where a group of scientists analyzed the carbon intensity of 9,000 fields, oil fields across 90 countries. Uh, that represents, I think, 98% of the world's crude oil and condensate production. The study confirms the significant greenhouse gas mitigation potential of selected crudes, and several of them are concentrated in this region of the world. Feature number two of the winners, uh, uh, President Kaplan has talked about operational flexibility. I will put actually operational and strategic flexibility and integration, uh, because those who have uh, flexibility and integration are able to optimize value from different assets, including utilities, renewables, but also downstream and now also midstream. I mean, a couple of examples. In 2020, uh, we've seen only one FID uh, in the LNG industry. That was a 3.25 million tons per annum Costa Azul plan in Mexico. Uh, 97 million tons per annum of liquefaction were frozen in 2020. But in the Middle East and North Africa, as a contrast, interesting developments are happening. In fact, the gas value chain registered in 2020 an increase of 13% in plan investments compared, I'm using the Apicorp's outlook 2019 outlook uh, of, of the year before. So you obviously have the need to cover domestic demand, but there are also strategic drivers for those increase behind these investments, uh, whether these countries are related to the developing of unconventional gas reserves or the increase of low cost LNG capacity like in Qatar to really capture more market share in an oversupplied market. So I think uh, the second interesting move that I wanted to highlight here is on the midstream side of the business. Uh, everybody knows the UAE closed a $20 billion deal for the acquisition of a minority stake and leased rights in its gas pipeline assets. Aramco would follow suit. It has large, well-maintained mystery inf infrastructure. The, the, I think the rationale is still the same. We are trying to unlock intrinsic value and monetize strong asset bases. The last feature that I would want to highlight today uh, of success is those coming with the least leverage position with the ability to preserve long-term value proposition and of course, dividends to shareholders. Um, with decrease in free cash flows, I think the players which reached 2020 with improved financial performance and improved metrics, net income, return on average, capital employed, free cash flow, et cetera, uh, are well positioned. And since everyone wants to talk about Saudi Arabia and Russia, I'll just use the example of Luke Oil and Saudi Ramco. Um, Luke Oil reached 2020 with a debt to equity ratio and the return on average capital employed of roughly 14, 15%, relatively similar to some of the best IOCs. South Ramco, when it raised $12 billion in its first bond issue in mid 2019, displayed a stellar 40%, 4-0 return on average capital employed. So these producers with concentration of low cost, low carbon assets in oil, gas, and now increasingly in renewables, uh, they are really able to uh, tap the debt market at quite interesting pricing at a time where U.S. Shell, as you've seen, uh, uh, is not able to use the same uh, deployment of capital. 
So I'd just like to conclude with a, with, a, with a couple of words. I mean, it's true that the IOCs in general will be seeking to diversify their portfolios. Uh, the larger national oil companies, as I mentioned, will secure their, try to secure their market share in a plateauing, not shrinking pie. Uh, there will be fewer smaller companies in this new, new landscape because of the consolidations and, and, and measures and acquisitions that we mentioned. But how this landscape look like? Uh, there are two numbers that I would want to leave you with before closing. Uh, 250 before 2015 and 100 going forward. There are about 500 to 600 hydrocarbon bearing basins in the world with enough proven and potential hydrocarbons. Before 2015, you had approximately 250 of these basins, which were the site of at least one new wildcat well exploration drilling annually. That number dropped to 160 basins after 2015. So today the COVID-19 pandemic and the accelerating energy transition is pushing that number towards 100 going forward. Thank you very much. And I remain available for questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Leila. Uh, I have a question uh, on the labor market. So uh, Kanal, maybe you can start and Leila, if you have any uh, thoughts uh, to chime in, because um, I think it's a, sort of a broader uh, industry uh, concern. But what's the impact of COVID-19 on employment? Uh, uh, data suggests that the U.S. oil and gas industry job losses range in a half a million. Uh, is this included in the survey and how will it impact U.S. production and exports? Uh, Kanal, you want to take that one? Uh, Joe, it's a great question that came in. Um, I, I would say primarily, so we've seen job losses uh, in, in in the U.S. for uh, related to COVID-19. Um, I think if you, if you just look at specifically the oil and gas sector direct jobs, employment is all the way down to levels we've seen back in maybe 2005, 2006. So this is before the shale boom. So very uh, large job losses. Um, there's a lot of indirect job losses though. So it's a little bit hard to say if the number like Joe mentioned is 500,000, but like it is definitely a significant loss in jobs. Um, it also affects uh, housing, construction. There's many other industries that are affected by job losses and energy. Um, when it comes to, you know, uh, you know, looking forward, uh, I think that if you see a, you know, if you see activity uh, remain at current levels, it seems like there's enough employees out there. But if you were to see a large increase in activity, that's where the challenges will occur because some employees may have moved on to another industry, especially if they're in oilful services. I think when it comes to the, the ones that work for EMP firms, uh, they, may, they may be more likely to uh, stick around for another uh, up cycle of inactivity. But when it comes to oilful services, um, that's where you're going to see that um, if there is a large increase in activity, there may not be uh, as many employees available. Leila, any concerns in a broader global context regarding uh, labor and skilled labor for the industry? Yeah, I think, thanks, thanks, Joe. I think uh, globally, the, the, the picture will be even more mixed because uh, in several countries, the, the job market is not as elastic as in the US. And, and you have a difficulty basic. That's why I, I mentioned the point about long-term unemployment, because in several countries, including the OECD European markets, uh, the job market is much is less active than in the US, and there is a more difficulty to transition between sectors. So in those sectors that were heavily affected by the pandemic, uh, I mean, entertainment or uh, the travel industry, et cetera, I'm afraid we are in a situation where it will be very, very difficult to model uh, the impact uh, because you will have actually that long-term unemployment. These are people that might not be able to get back to the job market, uh, even if uh, the economy recovers or rebound in uh, in, the, in in that uh, in that perspective. So my my concern is first whether the the rebound that we will see in 2021 is sustainable in emerging markets. And I'm not even talking about those countries that I mentioned as well that could become failed states because they're just unable to deploy uh, any stimulus plan or any uh, I would say uh, stimulus for for their economy for now. So um, I think in in many emerging but also some OECD countries uh, the job market situation will be much more difficult to have any rebound before 2022, 2023 at least. 
Okay, I've got two questions as it relates to uh, U.S. Uh, uh, energy exports. Uh, so maybe you both can comment on on these. The first one is uh, the massive freeze off last week in Texas uh, knocked a large percentage of U.S. natural gas <clears throat> production offline, and it hit exports to Mexico and and stopped LNG. And so the question is, does this impact the reputation of U.S. energy reliability? Uh, Canal, you want to? Any comments on that one? It's, it's a great question. I think that um, some things to think about is, again, the freeze-offs occurred because price, uh, because temperatures fell under in, into freezing. And so when you produce oil or natural gas, there's a, a large amount of uh, water that comes out, so that froze off. But now that temperatures are above 32 um, sources, which whether it's our energy executives in our district that we, we've spoken with, um, or just you know the general media that's out there, there's going to be a rapid recovery in U.S. production to prior levels. Um, the timing is a little bit uncertain, but you know people say one week, maximum three weeks. So we'll have to see how this evolves. But when it comes to reliability, I think generally people think about you know short-term reliability and long-term reliability. Uh, when it comes to short-term reliability, for example, Mexico relies on the U.S. for natural gas exports. So potentially Mexico could look to create some redundancies in case something like this happens. Um, the biggest challenge again, though, is that when it comes to natural gas, US natural gas prices are very low, two to $3 per MMBTU. Diversifying means paying more money for gas. LNG is generally, you know, let's say the six to $10 range. Um, and again, it, it and when it comes to pipelines, it's, it's, it, it, it comes in much more quickly than waiting for ships through LNG. So I, I don't think it's really tarnished, definitely not the longer term when it comes to short term. It, it really just depends on countries that rely on us in the immediate term. I think primarily it's Mexico. So I don't think it, it has made as much of a big difference. We'll have to see how long it takes to recover from the current freeze offs, but general estimates out there at most about two weeks. Lila, any comments? Uh, yeah, I mean, the main comment that I would have is about the cost of reliability, indeed. I mean, I think uh, we will have, I mean, the whole world will have to uh, pay a few more dollars because we will, we, I think if we assume that we will have more extreme, extreme weather events in, in the future, uh, events like this will be coming more and more recurrent. So it's, it's high time to uh, refurbish existing infrastructure and increase the flexibility of most producers. So that's why you know, for me, flexibility was my second characteristic of the winners, uh, definitely in, uh, in, in fusion. And that means also flexibility of the infrastructure. It also means, as, as, as Kunal rightly mentioned, uh, additional costs to, to make that infrastructure flexible. Right, I, I would just add, I think, you know, it, 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 would, it would be viewed as a weather related uh, uh, delay or an eruption. So it's much like, a, much like a hurricane would be, but I think you're right to point out, <laughs> we have to get ready for more uh, unexpected and extreme weather events. Uh, the other uh, question that relates to this is when prices firm as Governor Kaplan uh, suggested, uh, uh, what does that mean for the competitiveness of US gas on global markets? and coal to gas switching in the non-OECD region. Uh, Canal, I'll throw it to you. Any thoughts? Um, uh, Joe, can you re repeat it one more time? I think it was- Yeah, sure. When prices uh, firm, as uh, Governor Kaplan referred to, what does that mean for the competitiveness of US gas and global markets, and more particularly uh, coal to gas switching in the non-OECD region? Sure. So I, I think the big thing is, uh, you know, if the, the big challenge in switching from uh, coal to gas is mainly the price of LNG. So we've seen many countries around the world, the goal, they want to switch from coal to gas, but coal has generally been a cheaper, cheaper option. Um, gas prices, again, in the U.S., $3, but when you export it through LNG, 6 to 10 uh, when it comes to uh, purchasing coal, it, it's, it's definitely cheaper. The good news is that gas prices have remained between two and three dollars per MMBTU. Again, on a on a monthly basis, Henry Hub the last roughly ten years, um, and so moving up to maybe a four dollar gas wouldn't make much of a difference. Um, but most people again expect two to three dollars. I think the big challenge though is that coal on an energy equivalent basis is significantly cheaper than LNG. So really people have to weigh um, the, the, the CO2 output of coal versus natural gas, especially in the non-OECD world. Well, 
Yes, I, uh, well, I think the, the cold, I mean, the freezing winter that we had, I think this year uh, had at least one thing uh, positive is that it made the producers and LNG producers and consumers agree of the benefits of having uh, a low term or price linked uh, contracts. Uh, where they were totally, I mean, instead of continuing to try to negotiate away from uh, from uh, from uh, oil price linkage, uh, so I think for now it gave some 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 breathing space in terms of negotiating uh, new LNG contracts. But I think one interesting uh, uh, also if, if feature that is happening in non OECD market is in addition to the tr traditional coal coal to gas switching, it's gas to renewables and gas and renewables competition. And from that perspective, I think for those countries that are trying to move from uh, gas to power schemes to the so-called power to X scheme, which is to electrify most of the economy and make sure that the industry, especially the industrial sector and the hard to abate uh, industrial sectors are more dependent on electricity uh, primarily green electricity. Uh, that's what gas, natural gas and LNG is finding itself competing with in, in trying to open new markets because the, the existing markets are becoming more and more competitive and more and more saturated. So in, in order to be able to open new markets, I think the LNG industry is really trying now to position itself as a, a, as a long-term competitor to renewables uh, and uh, electricity, uh, large scale renewables, uh, instead of just the, the, the traditional uh, coal uh, competition that they've seen in the past that they're used to. Kanal, a question for you uh, regarding the survey, uh, uh, in, in particular the comment section of the survey. Any key themes that, that you see from the, the fourth quarter survey from the comments? Uh, so great question, Joe. And uh, just like the question mentioned, I think from the audience is that we collect uh, comments from the executives every quarter. It adds a lot of color. Um, it supplements the calls that we make with executives in our district. Uh, the key themes, uh, primarily, we saw a lot less uncertainty, a little bit more optimism, but they were still a little bit unsure, you know, what will happen next. I think, you know, the, the, the sector was was hard hit due to COVID-19. Um, but one key theme was there was a lot less pessimism, a little bit more optimism, um, but there's still lingering challenge with, uh, with getting capital, um, with, uh, you know, with bankruptcies. I, I think now that prices are above, you know, 50 to 60, the bankruptcies has kind of gone away. But the main thing is that there's still this lingering challenge of attracting capital, uh, attracting investors back to the sector. Yeah, uh, interesting uh, a question uh, that I'll pose uh, to both of you. In, in the post-COVID world, is the U.S. at the mercy of energy policy decisions in Riyadh and Moscow? Is the age of U.S. energy dominance over? I, I might add, maybe, maybe they're at the mercy of investors and not, <laughs> not decisions in Riyadh and Moscow, but I'll throw it open uh, to, to you, Canal. So we, we did ask a question in the third quarter 2020 survey, um, and that is, is, uh, is the oil market going to be more reliant on uh, decisions from OPEC influencing price going forward? It's not the exact wording, but it's mainly, will OPEC take a larger role in, in market pricing going forward? And roughly two thirds to three fourths said yes. And so when you look at uh, uh, the change in supply over the last year, most of the supply cut has come from OPEC and OPEC plus. However, the U.S. has contributed a significant portion. Um, I think, you know, production again has declined from 12.8 to 11.1. So 1.7 million barrels per day are roughly 15 or 16 percent. This is a permanent loss. This isn't a shut in. And so generally, and this is also when it speaks to the comments, there's quite a few comments that say, I can't predict the price of oil. It's very unclear what's going to happen with the price of oil. Uh, we're really at the mercy of the decisions that are made by OPEC+. Plus. Um, I may add, though, again, I, I go back to this, um, our, our, our break-evens. What's interesting is that the back end of the WTI's future curve is very close to these break-evens. And it's been that way since 2014, um, if I pull our KC Fed energy survey results. Um, and I think that the market still is relying, though, on shale, right? Because shale is a little bit, it is higher cost than, 
um, Saudi Arabia or Russia. Um, and it's a commodity. We all, we all producing the same thing. The market kind of sets the back end uh, to whoever is the high cost producer. And then the front end is influenced by supply and demand. And so I think that's where shale is still making its mark. I think that we do need U.S. shale, um, especially if demand starts to rebound significantly. Um, but on the other hand, among the executives, and again, our survey is, you know, these are from the executives themselves. They, they say that OPEC is going to take a bigger role um, in setting the price going forward. Layla? Thank you for the question, Joe. Um, I will ask you the same question very soon. <laughs> um, well, I, I think it very much depends on how you uh, define dominance. I mean, if you is, is if for if for the market dominance is becoming a swing supplier, even if I I actually don't like to take liberty with the, the definition of us, what a swing supplier is. Uh, yeah, I mean, whether you have uh, whether you you have invested in a large spare capacity by accident or not, and the capacity that you can activate in, in less than 90 days per definition uh, to, be, to increase uh, production, or uh, like, like US Shell, you have a very short, short cycle, which enables you to increase uh, production relatively fast, and then uh, you, you, you have to deal with, uh, with the decline rates. I think that's definition number one of, of dominance. Defici definition number two is, is what, I, what I talked about in my points, which is, uh, do you have access to the low cost, low carbon assets that you that you can produce at low, again, low cost to really free as much cash flow as possible because you shareholder, be it government or uh, or private shareholders uh, is demanding more, div more dividends. So I think as far as I'm concerned, I, I would go with the definition number two of dominance. Uh, but I leave it to the press and the media to, uh, to, to struggle with definition number one of, of dominance uh, between the three players that you mentioned, Joe. Well, thanks for that. Um, I, I think one of the key messages you've been hearing today, and if you joined us at the Outlook Symposium uh, last week, is uh, that despite all the uncertainty regarding the pandemic, that oil and gas investment is still needed. And at a large scale, if we're to avoid this big supply gap in the coming years, and and what I think we're we're hearing loud and clear today, and and some uh, from the discussion last week is that uh, U.S. producers are uh, you know not planning to <laughs> to make these investments uh, uh, to try to uh, maximize their current situations, and uh, and so I think this is a potential. Uh, uh, concern, I think that we need to uh, to keep monitoring here. So we're we're out of time. We have a lot more questions. I wish I could get into all of them, uh, but what what we need to leave it there. I want to thank again uh, Governor Kaplan and Kunal Patel and Dr. Benali for joining us today, and and to thank everyone who participated on the Zoom platform as well as those watching on the public live stream today. Uh, and once again, best wishes to everybody. Uh, all of our friends in, in Texas, we hope, hope the recovery is, uh, is quick. Um, it's another busy week for us at the IEF, uh, and, and I want to flag an important event that we have coming up on Thursday, the IEF European Union Energy and Climate Day, uh, with featured speakers, the EU Green Deal Commissioner, Franz Timmermans, uh, Saudi Arabia's Energy Minister, His Royal Highness Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman, as well as energy ministers from Belgium and Egypt, and who knows, maybe we'll have a a few more between now and then. That's Thursday, February 25th at 2 p.m. European time, 4 p.m. Riyadh time. This concludes our program. Have a good rest of your day or night, wherever you may be watching.